Yeah. <laughs> well, I say it's reassuring to be recognised, considering, as I said, I've been dead for 105 years. But, uh, isn't it wonderful to have your head just above a bar sign, eh? Very reassuring in itself. <laughs> Some of you will know that I was here, oh, 130 years ago. Can you imagine that, eh? Doesn't it look it, do I? No. <laughs> I, 130 years ago, I was involved in setting up the Macrahanish course there, adding bits and pieces of it, so... Yeah, it's nothing changed. It's still got the whole ambience of uh, a Lynx course, eh? <laughs> Some of you were out there trying to get your, your hole-in-one today. You know, my son, Tommy, he was the first the first to have a hole in one in the Open Championship when he was 17. <laughs> eh? At Prestwick there. You imagine he was still a teenager and he was a three times Open Champion. <laughs> of course, I won it myself four times. <laughs> I'm still the oldest winner, age 46. But of course, I was past my sell by date by the time the Championship came along. I mean, I played in my prime in the 1840s and the 1850s with these clubs. Just hang on to my stick, would you? Hey, seven clubs tucked under your arm. That's your play club, that's your driver, a long spoon, a short spoon, a baffy, a cleek, a rutting iron, and of course my putter here. <laughs> I changed days, you know. I started my career as a feather golf ball maker with uh, Alan Robertson in St Andrews. Of course, I was born and bred in St Andrews. I think we were all born with webbed feet and a golf club in our hand there. <laughs> 1821 it was, eh? Oh, oh St. Andrews, what you're laughing at? St. Andrews in a poor state at that time, you know. Oh, eh? Aye, the Reformation had uh, just turned the heart out of Scotland. It bankrupted St. Andrews, you know, and it was... It lay dormant for about 300 years. And, of course, it was this great game of golf that I've been involved with all my life that made the town sore again. <laughs> you know, I've played golf close on 80 years, and that's more than most folk get to live, so... There's a lot of memories, eh? I say I started my career as a, a feather golf ball maker with Alan Robertson, the wee cottage just behind the 18th green at St Andrews. And of course, Alan and I played foursomes together. Of course, that was the main game, you see. Two ball foursomes. Of course, at this time, the, the feather ball had been taken over by the gutter ball and the trains had linked up the links line. So suddenly the course was, uh, the course was uh, contactable and, of course, the ball was affordable. I mean, these early days, that feather golf ball, on a good day I could maybe make uh, two of them. <laughs> Half a crown each they were. Eh? Well, it was hard work making a ball. You know, it's just bull's hide it was. and you, you stitched it inside out and then you packed and pushed these feathers into that ball with a chest clamp. <laughs> of course, half a crown at that time was half of a man's weekly wage, you see. Oh, eh? Wasn't it so much the price of the ball, it's maybe on a bad day you've got to give your gentleman four or five of them to ensure that he actually gets around the course, eh? <laughs> so this was a great, a great breakthrough, this. The gutter ball, they say trains linking up the links land and then the ball suddenly affordable. And of course the whole game soared from that point on. <laughs> St Andrews was known as the metropolis of golf in the 18th, 17th and even 16th century. But there was hardly anybody playing the game. You know, Alan Roberts and I, on a good year, would maybe make 2,000 of these balls and they would be distributed to all the clubs around Britain. So that shows how few people were playing at that time. So, I mean, in my life now known as the grand old man of golf, well, I suppose so. I've outlived everybody, you know. But I've lived through all the major transitions in this game. You know, from the, say, the feather ball to all these early matches. You know, Alan Roberts and I were never beaten in foursomes from 1842 up until his untimely death in 1859. And with the train linking up to North Berwick from Glasgow down to, down to Ayr, we had up to 10,000 people supporting us. Eh? Morris and Robertson against the Park brothers from Musselburgh and the Duns, the twins from North Berwick. Oh, and they were wild days. In fact, Alan Robertson was actually was never beaten in the whole game. Of course, he chose his matches wisely, but uh, <laughs> the, re the, reason I'm, the reason I'm telling you about Alan Robertson was that, uh, you know, we fell out over the new ball and, uh, of course, we lost our livelihood, you see, so uh, I went down to Prestwick, of course, again, trains linking up the Lynx land, and I managed to compress 12 holes into that wee area, not realising it would be the, 
the first championship. But I say Alan never had a day's illness in his life. He just seemed to wither away and die. 42 he was. Anyway, the members at Prestwick, they said, now who is going to take over the mantle of the champion golfer of Scotland? <laughs> so uh, I've got the letter here. He wrote to six clubs. It says, please, please send a respectable caddy to see who will take over the mantle as the challenge belt. This was what where the Open Championship was played for, for that first 12 years, you see. <laughs> of course, there was only six of us professionals playing and two, two of the gentlemen made up the numbers and Willie Part won. <laughs> of course, he was my great adversary at that time, you know, but, uh, oh, I mean, I was runner-up to him, but I mean, I wasn't disappointed. I mean, I won three pounds. <laughs> no, I, uh, Willie didn't actually get any prize money, you see. He was just given this beautiful, soft, red Morocco leather belt, the challenge belt with beautiful silver work on it just to pose for a photograph, and then it was taken back into the Prestwick Golf Club. <laughs> of course, I went out and beat him in a match the next day, so it took all the significance of him being the champion golfer of Scotland. <laughs> you know, we used to have matches, and it wasn't just 36 holes, it was 36 rounds. Can you imagine that? Oh, eh? Well, a normal match was 12 rounds in the, in the six days, you see. Oh, eh? Aye, 36 rounds, 12 at Musselburgh, 12 at North Berwick, 12 at St Andrews and just the two Sundays travel time in between. <laughs> no, aye, we had to be fit in these early days. I mean, you've seen the state of the clubs we're wearing <laughs> aye, and the heaviness of our attire. You know, I used to have a swim every day of my working life, wherever I could find a bit of water. Eh? <laughs> All the way till I retired there, three strokes out and four strokes back. <laughs> well, it would have to be that way around, wouldn't it? I wouldn't be here now. <laughs> anyway, of course, we were playing all these matches. And, I mean, I won in 1861 and I won it again in 1862. Eh? Still hold the record for 13 shots. I won the Open Championship in 1862. There's never been a better winning aggregate in the whole history of the game. <laughs> the fact that there was uh, only four professionals playing that day was a minor detail from my point of view. <laughs> Ah, well, it was a bit insecure, you see. Eh? Of course, if you see, it was up to the members of Prestwick Golf Club. I mean, we were playing this in hostile weather. We were playing it after their autumn meeting in October, you see. And we were there as a kind of form of entertainment for the gentlemen. So it was up to them to create prize money for us. So there was, well, there was never very much money in these early days, you know. I mean, I came back to St Andrews and I was nearly 40 years keeper of the Greens, custodian of the links there, but... You know, up until that point, you made your clubs, you made your balls, you carried for your gentlemen. <laughs> You're on my registered caddy list of 18 caddies in 1888 in St Andrews. Four of them were past Open champions. So that shows you how little money there was in these early days. Eh? <laughs> I said to you earlier, Tommy went on and won three in a row. And well, there was a, there was a stipulation that if, although I'd won it four times, if your name was on it three years in a row, it was yours to keep. The same belt that I donated recently to the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. <laughs> so, of course, they, uh, there was no championship in 1871 because we invited uh, Musselbrand, we invited uh, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club to take it over, but no, they didn't redeem it important enough. Anyway, they did get together and they got enough money, £22, to buy a claret jug. Of course, the same claret jug that they still play for today. <laughs> and, of course, the first name on that, again, is Tommy. Four in a row. And then it comes to St Andrews. Five in a row? No, no, you see, the, these early days, I mean, you're talking about fairly basic rules, you know, no preferred lies as such. No, the course had been full of puddles, and one of my local caddies won it with the highest ever aggregate, so it just shows you you took your chance on the day. Well, of course, Tommy, by this time, we were playing exhibition matches from Edinburgh all the way down to, to Westwood Ho. I've got his driver there. Yeah, hang on to these ones. <laughs> you see how he's put... Uh, Three whippings up the shaft there. And of course, we used to purposely split the clubs. I suppose the equivalent in modern terms of how you wanted it stiff or whether you wanted it whippy. <laughs> yeah, I watched Tommy as a wee boy, that first sawn off club I put in his hand, <laughs> rabbiting about the dunes of Prestwick to this big athletic swing. You know, he used to hit the ball with such venom that his ball model bonnet and that his long shots would come flying off his head, you know. <laughs> but oh, his putting, it was, it was heaven sent, you know. <laughs> oh dear Tommy, yeah. <laughs> it's the great sadness in my life, you know. I mean, 
That's what Tommy missed. How many Open Championships would that boy have won? You know? I suppose I'll better tell you this story. It's, uh, it was on the 6th of December, 1875. Uh, Tommy and I were playing a match against the Park Brothers down at North Berwick. He wasn't keen to play. Of course, you see, he'd just married the year before and his pony wife, Margaret, she was heavy with his first child, but oh, she encouraged us. It was 25 pounds a side bet at that time, you know. It was good money for us by then. <laughs> anyway, we went and, uh, ach, we, we were winning easy though. I think we hit a bit of sand and the parts came back at us and we just managed to win on the last hole. But our dear, a telegram had arrived saying that Tommy's wife, Margaret, was struggling with his firstborn child and we had to make our way post haste back to St Andrews. There, there was a sponsor of the match, a Mr Lewis. He put up his schooner and a full crew and took us straight across the Firth of Forth. But our dear, as we left, another telegram had arrived saying that both Margaret and his firstborn son had died. And within four months, he too was it was all so quick. You know, he, uh, he, he started drinking. He, he, he uh, never had a drink in his life apart from Christmas and New Year or celebrating these great championships. And his drinking just got steadily worse and his, his heart wasn't in anything. It was up in the cathedral ground there with his wife and Bern. We tried, we bullied him, we cajoled him into playing again and no, he just ran himself down. We had one last chance with him, and this was only after two months, and at the beginning of November it was. What a mistake that was. There was a Captain Molesworth put out a challenge in the Scottish field, saying that one of his sons would play any professional for a third, meaning he gets a shot every third hole, the usual match, 12 rounds in the six days, but ah oh dear, there was a biting winds, sleet and frost. And because he was so run down, he developed pneumonia. He, uh, he seemed to rally. Just one week before Christmas, he went over to Edinburgh to visit some of his friends there. He went back on Christmas Eve, went up to see his mother. She was an invalid by this time. I heard him. I heard him get up on Christmas morning. And when he wasn't coming down, I went up to see. And there he was, lying as peaceful as I'd seen him since Margaret had died, and he too was dead. You know, because of the suddenness of it, they did an autopsy at the cottage hospital, said he'd burst an artery in his lung. <laughs> People say he died of a broken heart, but if that was true, wouldn't he be here either? There's a, there's a fine monument to him up in the cathedral ground there contributed by the 60 clubs that were in existence by that time, and an epitaph written beneath the sod, poor Tommy's laid, bunkered now for good and all, a better golf. It uh, wasn't just the sadness of young Tom's death, it was, ah, it was what he missed. I mean, the whole game was, was exploding. I said there were 60 clubs contributed to that bonny epitaph to him, and Within another 10 years, there was about 300. When I retired, there was over 1,500 courses. I mean, apart from coming down here in Macrahanish in about 1888, before that, I was, in, I was involved in laying out 78 courses from Shetland, even across to Ireland there, like Royal County Down. And the whole game was starting to explode. More and more people were playing it. The Open Championship was becoming more secure. And considering the quality of the opposition Tommy was playing against up until probably the triumvirate of Arden and Taylor and Braid in the 1890s, he probably wouldn't have been challenged to his feats. It would have been folklore. <laughs> you see, it's been like a constant, constant fight for me in my career. Like tradition against technology, technology against tradition. I'm not going to bore you with all the major changes that I had to do to keep up with the game on the old course and all the heckling and banter that I got for it. When I say I've been involved in every aspect of the game. <laughs> I said earlier, the grand old man of golf. Well, I suppose I, uh, I survived my whole family. <laughs> my three sons, a daughter, 
I think the shock of young Tommy's death killed my wife Nancy and all my contemporaries. And of course, golf magazines started to reel their head in 1890, and then of course you had the first English Open. Eh? Muirfield started up in 1892, and they suddenly brought it forward to June, a less unhospitable time of the year. Eh? And they put guaranteed prize money on it, playing four rounds in two days. And then we had the first English Open down at Sandwich, and the emergence, I said, of Varden, Taylor and Braid, and then off to Hoylake, and just huge crowds, Scotland, England matches, exporting clubs to America and balls. And God, it was like a mass exodus in the 1890s. Anybody that could profess to lay out a green or swing a club, off they went to America. I lost five of my club makers. Three of them won your amateur and your, your, your professional championships there, and Fowlis and Anderson and Herd. <laughs> so I lived through many, many changes. But, uh, I'm just going to finish here with the. Uh, you give me my cleek. Eh? Let's see now. Here we go. When I retired in uh, nine, you it? Oops. When I retired in 1902, the members of the Royal Ancient Golf Club were. Uh, well, they were very good to me. Uh, we had one member, a prominent member, a portrait painter, Sir George Reid. He took me to his studio in Edinburgh, the same portrait that hangs above the fireplace in the main lounge of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club today. <laughs> now he says, Tom, this is maybe going to take a while, so I want you to adopt a position appertaining to golf that you feel comfortable with. So I just took my clique and I just, uh, I just did that. He says, and what does that signify? I says, I'm just waiting for the gentleman to play. <laughs> to me, that was more important than the playing itself. Folk are far more concerned with their own games instead of appreciating what's all around them. <laughs> may look as if my early career was a wee bit subservient, but no, no. There was a common bond, a sharing. And this great game has been my life. <laughs> anyway. It's been a long day for me, but uh, it was fine to get back on the, the dunes and the links of Macrahanis. So I'm just going to take my leave of you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>